Today's lesson was recorded on September 28, 2021, and is the second lesson in our weekly Bible study on the book of Matthew. So today we're going to take a look at the genealogy that opens Matthew's gospel. In particular, we look at the structure Matthew gives the genealogy and see how that structure communicates a message about Jesus and redemptive history. So this Bible study is presented live each week. If you're interested in joining the live study, it's every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Pacific, and you can head to our website, figtreeteaching.com. At the banner of the top, you'll see a link to join our Bible study. You can click there to sign up. There's no cost to the study, although it looks as though you're purchasing something. In reality, you're not. It's simply the method that we have for bringing people on board. Also at our website, you'll find the handouts for today's lesson, as well as underneath week one, you'll find the entire reading plan for the study on Matthew. So we hope that this study through the book of Matthew blesses you and helps you see just how deep the scripture is. So as we look at things through the cultural lens of first century Judaism, we always end up seeing things that we've never seen before. And usually what's there is quite powerful and helps in solidifying the foundations of our faith. So we hope you can join us at some point live in the Bible study. If you can't, that's okay. You can catch it on video. So enjoy today's lesson on the genealogy of Jesus. We're going to talk about the genealogy and in Matthew 1, and I'm going to call it light into darkness. I don't know if that's wise or not, but that's what I'm going to call it, because I think by the end you'll see what I mean by light into darkness. Well, you'll judge whether I got that correct, but I think there's something going on here that Matthew, he's very deep into a structure, and the structure is going to communicate something about what he's telling us. But it's the structure. It's not the words. It's the structure of way, the way he sets this up. So we'll see how we do on that. Light into darkness. All right, so we are on, this is our Matthew study, week two. The picture behind there, the background picture here, is the synagogue at the city of Capernaum. Many of you have been to that synagogue. What you see there, the stones and the pillars is not something Jesus would have known. This comes from the 3rd or 4th century. But the site of the synagogue, they excavated down along the edges, and you can see there's a base under there of a, something that would have been there earlier. So when the, it says that Jesus was in Capernaum at the synagogue, we know there was a synagogue. It's just not that one. But that's the one that they have there today. Really a gorgeous place. There is some debate about this, but it appears Matthew's from somewhere around Capernaum, so we'll stick Matthew in Capernaum, and Jesus is going to be there in the synagogue, and it's a very rabbinic-oriented place, and today as we talk about the rabbinic mind, that'll be a good setting for us to sit in the synagogue and learn from the rabbis. All right, so if you want to turn to Matthew 1, we'll be in Matthew 1. We're not going to read the whole thing. But that's where you'll want to be in your Bible. And then, by way of review, just very quickly, because last week, you know, we, this idea of the kingdom of heaven, it's not easy. Partly because, you know, I show up and I ask you to consider an idea, conceptual idea. We all have a conceptual idea when we hear kingdom of heaven. And then I ask you to say, well, let's think about it a little bit differently. And sometimes that's difficult to change the way that we conceive, particularly something as important as the kingdom of heaven. So last week, I was suggesting, and this, there's many scholars who have studied this way more than I have, have said, you know, the kingdom of heaven, and especially in Matthew, is much more of a present reality than some place or time in the future. And so when we see this phrase, kingdom of heaven, we've got some problems, because in English, with our Western way of thinking, uh, it doesn't always work out to get to the Hebraic way of thinking about it. So the first thing, and I, we, this was review from last week, we talked about the word heaven. That, stum that causes us to stumble a little bit, because in this case, heaven is a replacement word for God, at least in Matthew. So when you hear Matthew say kingdom of heaven, 
you have to mentally say, ah, kingdom, he's talking about the kingdom of God. But he's not using the word God. He's using a replacement word. So that's step one. Then this word kingdom, and this is more, again, Hebraic thinking, this kingdom is really, um, would be better phrased, the reign of God rather than the kingdom. Because when we hear kingdom, we think of it as a noun. It's a place or a place in time. And that's not really what the phrase is saying. It's saying the reign of God is happening. And then you could take the reign and you could say, well, it's active. It's an active reign of God. When's it happening? Right now. Does God reign in your life? The kingdom of heaven is here, is near. In fact, that, the phrase is near is an intimate near. So something very active. How do we enter the shalom of God right now? And yes, there will be a place in the future that we also call heaven. But when this phrase is talking about the active role of that. So, for instance, Jesus sends out his disciples, says, go heal the sick and drive out demons. So when they drive out evil, what do they say? What's their proclamation? The kingdom of heaven is near. Good news, people. God is actively present, available. And I know many of you on the call have had those moments in your life when you thought you knew God was acting. You know, something happens in, around you and you think, that was no coincidence, that was God acting. Or the prayer is answered, or however that works. You know, it's experiential. You know that the kingdom of God is breaking through into the present and you saw reality shift around you. And uh, it's very much experienced, right? And you see the kingdom of heaven. That'll, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll have one of those in Matthew coming up. It's something you experience either with your physical eyes or your spiritual eyes. So I know my, when people say to me, well, you just have faith in the Bible, and I say, well, no, 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 my, my faith in God is much more, it's very much experiential. Not just that I read the book and somehow believed it. It's like I experience God, and that keeps me going on a daily basis. So anyways, that's, let me show you one book in case you're looking for information on this or you want a resource to go to. This is a real small book, but it's packed. I didn't put this on your handout, and I apologize. Understand, it's called Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus. And the gentleman who wrote this, his name is David Biven. David Biven lives in Jerusalem, and he is the founder of a, of a, a publication called the Jerusalem Perspective. So if you uh, look up JerusalemPerspective.com, they have a number of, great, of wonderful articles. And the whole idea is to go back into the Hebraic way of thinking. How did they look at the text through the Jewish mind, and what can we learn from our gospel studies? Good book. He talks about the active uh, nature of the kingdom of, of God. So if you wanted another resource, that would be a place to go. Okay, that's just a quick review. We will keep hitting the kingdom of heaven all the way through Matthew over and over and over. All right, number two on your handout. Today is going to be a good introduction to the fact that Matthew is steeped in the Hebraic mind. And we'll talk a little bit about what does that mean. But the Gospel of Matthew, it's the most Hebraic or the most rabbinic. People often say it's the most Jewish. It reflects, the, the Gospel of Matthew reflects more than the other three, the way the rabbis interpreted the text, the way the rabbis put things together. We'll see some of that tonight. So it's the most Jewish of all of them. There are a number of different church fathers. Uh, Papias, Origen, Eusebius, they all mention that Matthew was originally written in Hebrew or Aramaic. So we have Greek Matthew, but they say, no, there was an original in, the, in either Aramaic or, or Hebrew that Matthew wrote, which means Someone took Matthew in the Hebrew or Aramaic, translated it to Greek, and that's what happens when it translates over to Greek, is you often lose 
some of the Hebraisms that are there, the Jewish idioms, don't always translate well into the Greek. So there are scholars like David Biven that I just mentioned over in Jerusalem. They will try to go back and reconstruct from the Greek what would it say in Hebrew, and then try to pull then those Hebrew sayings to find out what is that, what did that mean to them. Okay, uh, let's see. So originally written in either Hebrew or Aramaic, and then one of the things that we see in Matthew is uh, the rabbis. You know, they have a collective mind. The way that we, you know, Christians have a collective mind. We can use phrases back and forth that if you're not inside our circle, you don't know what we're talking about. The rabbis have a collective mind, and they have, interp they have interpretation techniques to draw out of that, their Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, draw that meaning out. And Jesus uses these techniques. Paul uses these techniques. Matthew uses the techniques. So we'll see a little bit of that tonight, and then, God willing, talk about it as we go through the study. But we really want to notice that the rabbinic mind is really a different way of thinking about scriptural interpretation than we have in the West. And the rabbis have a number of shared conventions, ways that they look at their, uh, the Hebrew Bible, that they come up with interpretation. Some of them can be very creative. Matthew can be particularly creative. One of uh, my professors uh, in seminary said, if Matthew was in a modern seminary, he'd probably fail, because the professors would say, no, you can't make that interpretation, you can't make that connection. So one thing I did on the email is I sent a separate handout. The separate handout is a technique that Matthew's using, and it's, um, we're not going to cover them, we don't have time, but it's fulfillment texts. Ten times, there's ten fulfillment texts. This was done to fulfill what the prophet said, and then he quotes the prophet. And some of those are a real stretch. I mean, scholars really wrestle with, what is Matthew talking about? He's making a real stretch with some of those fulfillment texts. So that's what the professor meant by he would probably fail, because many of those you think that is not what that text means, but he's, he's very creative in coming up with that. Okay, the idea with the rabbinic mind, and we, don't, we miss this, is everybody involved, the speaker, the listener, everybody in the audience, they're searching for the layered meaning. So when the rabbi says one thing, or Matthew writes a certain way, you start scanning your mind, because you have the Hebrew Bible memorized, and you try to find what it is he's talking about. It's not always straightforward logic. It's, they want to cause you to think. All right, so that's tough for us because we don't think that way. But that's what we're going to try to do today is address a little bit of that. So in, in this regard, when we look at Matthew and we look at the genealogy, we can go to rabbinic writings that we have, and we can say, ah, we see... Uh, writings on genealogies. We see writings that include um, uh, redemptive history. And then you start to see that th they compare. They, 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 they're, they look similar. So, for instance, in a number of rabbinic writings, and I, I put it down on your sheet, redemptive history is always broken up into three parts. It's a tripart history. So the rabbis say, uh, the earth will be here, or at least, you know, however they think about the age of, the age of everything is 6,000 years. 2,000 years here, 2,000 years here, 2,000 years at the end. And they break it up into 2,000. That's, you'll find a number of those. Very often that redemptive history, God redeeming the world out of the chaos, ends with the Messiah. So we find in rabbinic writings, tripart redemptive history. Well, what do we find in Matthew? This genealogy is redemptive history, and it's in three parts. There was the generations from Abraham to David, from David to the exile, the exile to the Messiah. So it also ends in, with the Messiah. As Matthew's doing that, as he's creating that, he's within the context of that rabbinical thought. Uh, if you look at the Talmud, it's the, in the Talmud, it's Sanhedrin 97a. If you Google t Sanhedrin 97a, you go to the bottom of that, you'll find three or four examples of them 
of the rabbis breaking up redemptive history into three parts. The second thing is, rabbinic writings, they always begin redemptive history with Abraham. Who does Matthew begin his genealogy with? Abraham. Because Abraham is the turning point in history. He's the beginning of God's redemptive history. There's one um, genealogy, begins with Abraham, and has 14 generations. I, I, put the, I put the name of the rabbinic writing on your handout. So we have one, begins with Abraham, and goes 14 generations. Well, what does uh, Matthew do? Three parts, begins with Abraham, 14 generations. So my point is, when I get to the end and we're talking about the possible structure of Matthews, it's, be, it's because the reason we can, we can conjecture this is because you have rabbinic writings that say the same thing, that, or at least they don't conclude that Jesus is Messiah, but they're structured the same. So that's the main point. We want to know there is a collective mind that when Matthew writes, his audience gets it. So, for instance, uh, at the bottom of your page one, there is, I have this book referenced. It's called The Mind Behind the Gospels. And mind is he's talking about the collective knowledge that everybody has. It's shared. His name is Herbert Basser. He's Jewish, and he's a Talmudic scholar. So as he reads Matthew, he says, aha. See, we've got it over here, this rabbinic writing here. And you read it, and you're like, oh, that sounds almost exactly the same. This, this book is, it's, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have it number one on your list if you're just beginning to, to go down the path, because it's, it's more complex. But it is a good commentary, if you're, if you're looking for that, that brings out of the rabbinic writing. Next, another book that I, again, I apologize, I forgot to put on your handout. Many of you know. While many of you in San Diego know, Rabbi Barney Kasdan. So this book is called Matthew Presents. It's actually Matthew Presents Yeshua, King Messiah. Rabbi Barney Kasdan is a Messianic Jewish rabbi. His uh, synagogue is Kehalat Ariel in San Diego. I know that many of you know Rabbi Barney. This is another good resource. He brings out a lot of the rabbinic ideas around the book of Matthew. So that would just be another resource for you to have. Okay, so Matthew and the Hebraic mind. This is going to be important as we get to the end. And to show you how, um, you know, we think very linearly, the rabbinic mind thinks like in a circle, you know, it's not, nothing is straightforward. So considering that we're not in a straightforward movement, the place I'd like to start with is Psalm 89. And you think, now, how does Psalm 89 connect to the genealogy? Well, let's go take a look, because Psalm 89 is a messianic psalm. This would be an important one for us believers in Messiah Jesus to pay attention to. God had, has promised a king in the line of David, but the psalmist is saying, okay, where's that king? And God's like, I keep my promises. So this is a messianic psalm. And, by the way, for those who have been in the class for a while, we've seen this psalm before, because when Jesus went across the sea to, to um, heal the, the crazy man, and the storm rose up, it's referencing Psalm 89. Jesus wakes up and stills the storm. And Psalm 89 says, it's verse 9, you rule over the sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. And that's when the disciples say, whoa, who is this guy? So Psalm 89, very important. We're going to look at three verses, 35 to 37. So if you have your Bible open, look down at verse 35 to 37. So remember, God promised a, a future king in the line of David. And our genealogy today is going to address a future king in the line of David. So verse 35, this is from the NIV. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness. And you know, when God swears by his holiness, he means it. I will not lie to David. So he's telling the psalmist is saying, God says, look, I'm, I, I'm not lying to David. His line 
will continue forever, or um, its descendants, really. His descendants will continue forever. Now, that's important. We're talking about his line. His line will continue forever. His throne endure me before the sun. It will be established forever like the moon. Now, the it there is the line of his uh, descendants. So, verse 37, it will be established like the moon, the faithful witness in the sky. So, you have this idea. The line of David is going to continue forever, and it's going to be established like the moon. Now, that seems a little bit bizarre to us. So, these two are really connected. The line to the moon. And you think, now why is the moon in Israel? What does the moon have to do with Israel? Well, the moon actually plays a significant role with Israel, not as an object of worship, but as a metaphor and for the cycles of life. What does the moon do? It reflects light into the darkness of the world. What's Israel supposed to do? Reflect God's light into the darkness of the world. Right? So the moon doesn't create its own light. It reflects the sun's light. Israel doesn't create its own light. It reflects God's light. We don't create our own light. We're supposed to reflect God's light into the world. And the moon, just like the world, goes through cycles and it goes through a period of darkness, just like the world does. And eventually, though, the light comes back and it breaks through. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about, God willing, Hanukkah, because it's a great picture of the, the, the moon getting darker at the darkest time of year, and as the moon gets darker at the darkest time of year, you put a candle in your window to project God's light out into the darkness of the world. So the moon has a connection to Israel and to David's descendants. So something about the moon. Okay, so that's our very tangential way. We'll come back to that, God willing, at the end. Okay, you can go back to uh, Matthew 1 if you have your Bible open. So the question that what Matthew's going to have to do, he's about to tell this story. He's telling the story of Jesus. What he needs to tell his audience is, is Jesus the promised Messiah? Is he the one? Is he the Messiah of Israel? So he does it using two techniques or two things in the text. The first one is the genealogy. We'll do that tonight. And the other one are the fulfillment text, the things I sent you. They're giving credence to the, to the story you're reading, because you're trying to figure out, is he really telling us about the Messiah? And all, all along the way, he's laying down the foundation to say, yes, what I'm presenting to you is the Messiah. So the genealogy becomes a really important piece to this uh, that is setting up the genealogy is laying the foundation for what's about to come in the text. So that's why we open up with that, that genealogy. All right, so the question that we would ask ourselves is, is he the promised Messiah? And the one thing you want to do is look at that genealogy and say, does it qualify Jesus to be the Messiah? That's, what, that's what's going to, this genealogy is going to help us narrow down if Jesus is the actual Messiah. So if you have your Bible open, we'll go to Matthew 1, and right off the bat, the very first sentence that's going to pop up in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. Now, I don't know what, which Bible version you have, but that's the NIV post-2011. And notice, if you, look at my, if you look at the 1984 NIV, it says Jesus Christ. And they changed it because really it's the title, Jesus the Messiah, or your Bible might say Jesus the Christ, not his last name, his title. His title is the king. Messiah means anointed one. Christ is Greek for anointed one. So Jesus the Messiah, he's the son of David, right off the bat. This has a tremendous meaning in the first century. That phrase, son of David, took on technical meaning for the Messiah. So uh, on your handout, oh yeah, on your handout under number five, as we're starting Son of David, there's a writing from about 50 BC. It's called the Psalms of Solomon. 
And the Psalms of Solomon is a messianic type psalm. Hey, we're waiting for a king to come clear out, you know, all these uh, sinners here in Jerusalem. And the reference to that, that Messiah is son of David. So you see the gospel writers using that phrase, son of David, like Mark. When Mark uses son of David, the ironic thing is the very first person in Mark to call Jesus son of David is the blind guy, right? So there's the irony. The blind guy can see that he's the son of David. No one else can. All right. So son of David, that's important. Then son of Abraham, because the Messiah has to be Jewish. He's not from Poland or Norway, no offense to any, any of those countries or Peru or wherever else. If you're going to be qualified to be the Messiah, you've got to be a descendant of Abraham. You have to be Jewish. So right off the top, he's laying out these, you know, bona fides that, of Jesus so that the reader knows what's coming next. All right, now, go into um, Matthew 1. If you just look at, say, verse 2, we'll start. I'm not going to read all of this, but I just want to show you what he's doing. So the first thing to notice, Matthew deliberately uses 14 generations. The problem is there's way more than 14 generations between Abraham and David. That's like a thousand years. So he's hand selecting the names. He's, he had to remove a bunch of names, but the names he kept, we want to know why did he keep them? He's telling us something by the names he kept. And it was no problem in, uh, in Jewish genealogies to leave out a whole bunch of people and you connect them over large spans of space. So he has to whittle it down to 14 because we need, we need the number 14. So he starts out, Abraham was the father of Isaac. So right there, he tells you, ah, Abraham's in the line. Now, Abraham also starts redemptive history, God redeeming the world. And the redemptive history ends with the Messiah. That's the genealogy. So Abraham, the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Now, that's normal to keep Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in there. But Jacob has a very important messianic prophecy about Jacob. And I put it on your sheet. I, I'm not going to have you turn there because we don't have time. But it shows up with Balaam uh, in the book of Numbers. You can go back and read it. But in, at the end of Numbers, Balaam says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. I see something, but it's not near. A star will come out of Jacob. There's Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. And scepter, of course, means king. So this is a really important messianic prophecy. So you, you can't come out of, you could be a descendant of Abraham, but you're not going to come out of Esau. You got to come out through Jacob. Okay, so that, just so you know, that's there. And that would be a key factor in doing this. So Abraham, Jacob, Jacob is the father of Judah and his 12 brothers. Now, right there, the nation is divided into 12, but only one tribe is going to hold the Messiah. That's Judah. So you've got to be from, from uh, Judah. And then we're going to see this in a couple of weeks, but the next name on the list, and I won't go too much into it, but verse three, Judah, the father of Peretz. Peretz, we say Perez. It's anglicized. Peretz, it means the explosive one. And wait till we get a few weeks from now, you're going to see the kingdom uh, since John the Baptist, the kingdom has been advancing explosively and explosive men take hold of it. That's Peretz. So in uh, Jesus's DNA, he has a little exploder. That would be uh, a good way to interpret that. So we'll see that in a couple of weeks. Let's go down to the bottom here. So you've got Abraham and Jacob and Judah. You've got, then it says the father, or you, you get the name Jesse in there. Now, why include Jesse of all the names? Well, he's the father of David, but it, it also fits with Isaiah 11, Isaiah 11, 1, the shoot out of the stump of Jesse. So he's including names to make sure you can connect them to some messianic prophecy back in the Old Testament. And then, of course, Jesse, the father of King David, and we know the prophecy from uh, Samuel where God says, You'll be, your throne will extend forever. So, okay, 
really important. The, the key to this is Matthew's laying out how do we know that Jesus is qualified? Abraham, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, King of David. All of those have meaning, messianic meaning, and there's more in there, but no time tonight. So, does he qualify? Yes. You're narrowing down and narrowing down and narrowing down. Matthew's going to do it even more as the text goes by to show you we're narrowing this in so he's, he's uh, qualifying as the Messiah. That's just one, a- uh, one aspect of, of the genealogy. But I want to go to the big, uh, a big question we have. And before I do that, I need to just throw a couple words out about Abraham. Because we view Abraham through our 2,000-year lens through Jesus and the New Testament. And in the first century, Abraham, and even in the, in the Jewish mind today, Abraham takes on a bigger role than we often give him. All of those stories about Abraham provide lessons for, um, especially in the first century, but the Jew, even the Jewish people today. So Abraham's an important figure. And I want to show you a couple things about the way they think about Abraham. I mentioned this. Uh, Abraham always, um, he always leads redemptive history. He's the new phase in human history. There's a rabbinic writing that says the generations prior to Abraham, well, yeah, they're chaotic, and you don't really pay attention to them. Once you get to Abraham, now redemptive history begins. So Abraham represents this new phase where God's going to come in, and he's going to make that covenant and begin the relationship that's going to move humanity forward. It's going to change everything. Because one person got drawn out of their household, their land, and their um, everything that they knew. Now, in another rabbinic writing, they compare Abraham to the divine light, just like in Genesis 1. And what they mean by that is, the world was in darkness. And out of that darkness, God called one human being. And when God called that one human being out of the darkness, it's as if light started streaming into the darkness. So just like at creation, when light hits the darkness and it splits everything, and out of that chaos, order begins to happen. So when light is shined into the darkness, you get um, truth and lies can be compared. Good versus evil can be compared. Right versus wrong. Abraham represents this light of truth and righteousness and justice. Uh, God says to Abraham, I want you and your household to do what is right and be just. So it's it's like it's a brand new thing that's now creating order in the world. And then, of course, the covenant that God makes with Abraham in Genesis 15 is fulfilled in Jesus. So He's the beginning of redemptive history. And the important thing is, is this emphasis on light, that he is a, he's a ray of light in the darkness. We don't think of Abraham that way. But watch when we put together this stuff at the end here. Abraham is the, the ray, a ray of light in the darkness. Okay, that was just real quick about Abraham, setting up what's coming next, okay? So we have a a genealogy that's going to tell that Jesus is qualified to be the Messiah. And one question we have is, why 14 generations? Because he's deliberately placing it into 14 generations. So he's choosing that number, Matthew is, for a particular reason. And there's basically two thoughts. They're both of them rabbinic, and they both require some kind of way that something about the way that the rabbis think about the text. So the first one, and this is under number seven on your handout, is he wants to emphasize David. He's the son of David. That's a messianic term. He's got to be in the line of David as a king, because he's being presented as the king. So how do we, how do we, in a deeper way, show that? He's connected to David. So this is at least one idea. Scholars, we don't, scholars don't really know. Um, but anyways, the Hebrew alphabet, we say alphabet, but the Hebrew alphabet, because it begins, the first letter is aleph, the second is bet, 
So it's the Hebrew al Aleph Bet. The Hebrew Aleph Bet has, is both a letter and a number. So every Hebrew word has a numerical value. So for instance, here's, the, here's Aleph, and that's number one. Here's Bet, and that's number two. And so you could take any Hebrew word and come up with a numerical value. This is what we did with John and the miraculous catch of 153 fish. And scholars think, aha, we know what he's doing. You go back to a word in Ezekiel, you add that word up, what do you come up with? 153. He's connecting that to Ezekiel. So they love to do connections with numbers. Now, of course, we're disadvantaged because we don't know Hebrew and most of us don't know that they also use numbers. So anyways, as you go down through the Hebrew alphabet, there's numbers involved. Now, what if we then take David, take the name David? So David is, there's no vowels used, it's consonants. Dalit, D, equals, that's a four. Then a vav, so D, V, D. Vav equals six, and then you would have another four. So I can see Dave, he's already got it figured out, but uh, for the rest of us, how do we do that? Then we got to do the math, right? So do dalid, vav, and a dalid, and you get a four, and you get a six, and you get a four, and what's the grand total? Fourteen. And you say, aha, is it coincidence? Is it coincidence that David's name equals 14, and so then Matthew divides the, the generations into 14 generations to emphasize the, the connection with David? Hey, that might very well be it. We don't know. But there's another example, and I think this one is even better. I think this is probably more accurate. Not that this one would be wrong, but this one's better. So we go back to that question, why 14 generations, right? Well, there's another example in rabbinic writings that has to do with the cycle of the moon. Now we read Psalm 89, the descendants of David are like the moon, a witness in the faithful witness in the sky. The cycle of the moon, technically 29.5 days. One of those days includes a new moon, where there is no moon, where the sky is dark, right? The sky goes dark on the new moon. The very first little sliver that comes out of that darkness of the moon begins the first day of the month. And once they see that in Jerusalem, they blow the shofar, or however they announce it, as at the beginning of the month. And then they light these fires, and it tells everybody from all the way up to Galilee, even to Babylon, they say, that it's the beginning of the new month. So the cycle of the moon. And they note something about the cycle of the moon. So let me put up a graphical depiction here. If the new moon is at the bottom here, so the new moon means there's nothing in the sky, it's pure, utter darkness, you suddenly get a... Um, Light coming back, reflection of God. Light is breaking forth, and the light begins to increase, and it increases for 14 days. So that you have an ascending light, and it gets up to that full moon to where God's light is fully being reflected back into the darkness. And then it goes on a 14 day period, and it descends back down until ultimately you get in back into the darkness of the new moon. And then it cycles around again. So you also have a 14-day connection to the moon. So there's a, a rabbinic writing that starts out a genealogy with Abraham. It's talking about the moon, and it ascends up through the generations. So watch what this is what now, if you take that as an example, you'd say, what is Matthew doing? Well, what is Abraham? The world was in darkness. It's the new moon. God's light is not being shined into the light and into the darkness of the world. And Abraham shows up. He's like that first sliver of light. So he's right at the top of the genealogy. Abraham is number one. And then, how many generations do you go? Do you ascend until you hit to the, the 14th? 
It's well, I just answered your question. 14 generations. And who's there? David. So it's like the from Abraham to David is in uh in ascending light. I probably, oh, I can already see it. Walter's already pointing out my flaw. I think I did this backwards, huh, Walter? I can see him. He's like tracing. Let, let's just hang with me, even, even though the slide's backwards. Okay. You start with Abraham. He breaks in. It ascends to David. That's the 14th position. Matthew's showing you that there's an, there's an ascending nature till we reach the glory of David. And then that glory continues a bit with Solomon, yes? So it continues with Solomon. But what happens right after Solomon? Oh, it's terrible, right? I mean, even Solomon starts, he's sinning, his sons are a mess, and everything begins to descend down back into chaos. 14 generations, right? And where do you end up after that next 14th generation? In exile. You're back in the new moon. You're in darkness again. So one of the thoughts is, because we find this elsewhere in rabbinic writings, is Matthew's talking about the moon cycle. He's, he's connecting Psalm 89. The descendants of David are like the moon. And he shows that it's an ascending uh, up until the point of David. Then you get descending down to the exile. And then, of course, we go back out of the exile. You get an ascending nature again. And who's now, who is Matthew telling us? after 14 generations is at the top, is Jesus. So he now fits in that full moon type position to say, we've now ascended back up to the same position that King David was. At least in the rabbinic idea, you're, you're just telling, you're painting a picture. It's not, um, you're not pulling out our slide rule and trying to do scientific calculations, but you're, you're painting a picture of what's happening from the exile back up to Jesus in David's descendants. So, now, there's a problem. Matthew says this, there's 14 generations from Abraham to David, there's 14 generations from uh, David to the, to the exile, and those two are correct. And then he says there's 14 generations from the exile to Jesus. But if you count the names... So instead of 14 generations, you get 13. There's 13 names. So Matthew is either really bad at math, or he's doing it for a reason. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that reason is. He only puts 13 names, but then he says there's 14 generations. And so then you start to think, well, if Jesus is the 13th name, who sits at the height? I don't know. Is it, is it maybe the resurrected Jesus is the, is the Messiah, the King of the, the universe? Perhaps he's leaving it open-ended. Maybe it's his general, maybe it's the people he's writing to saying, you be the full moon. Jesus is bringing us into this in redemptive history. You now be the full moon. You reflect God's light back into the darkness. Maybe it's the church. Maybe it's us. Maybe we're supposed to take up that final generation. So anyways, I just wanted to point out, if you count the names, there's only 13, even though Matthew tells us there's 14 generations. I don't think he's trying to be completely accurate in his technical calculations, but I think he's painting us a picture of something. A, that the light is shining again for Israel. And I think possibly that, that being left open on, that, on Jesus being the 13th name, even though there's 14 generations, there's something that goes a little bit beyond that. So anyways, just a thought, and you'll have to go back and consider this, and it's the first time you've ever heard about the moon cycle and possibly this, this uh, genealogy. Um, so the two things, why 14 generations? Well, Many scholars will come up with this one easily, David's name, 14. And then, of course, you have the moon cycle. Let me do a quick review. And one, one thing to note, sorry, I'm going to go back one. The message is not just in the names. The message is in the structure of the genealogy. He's very purposefully structuring it in a way that tells you something. 
and it's normally much deeper. We would have to know our Bible and know what's going on. And since the moon is so intimately connected with Israel, it's really a, uh, it would be a really, I think, a very solid solution to what he's doing with 14. So, as way of review, because we're, we're running way past time, uh, the rabbinic mind. So the rabbinic, the rabbinic mind, it's the way that they think collectively that we don't. We don't have to think, we don't think that way. And so we'd, we need to do a little bit of work to go learn that, because then you start to see things in Matthew that we didn't see before. Psalm 89, very important psalm and a connection to the moon. Then you would say, well, does Jesus qualify to be Messiah? Well, he lines everybody up so that the reader knows all those names in a row are telling you, yep, he's in that line. But then a, a greater one is, well, we went over Abraham in the, in the light in the dark world. It's Jesus is the light of the world. And so he presents to you, at least if it's the, if it's the moon cycle, something about light into the darkness. And then, is it possible? I, I, we'll ask Matthew when we get to heaven. Why only 13 names? What's the point? Did he have it? I'm sure. I guarantee you it's not a mistake. He knows what he's doing. Um, but what about that 14th generation? Is that us? Is that the church? Is it whomever? And even if it's not, well, go be the light in the darkness of this world. Because we all know darkness is rising, and we don't need to point fingers and just yell at people. We need to increase our light reflect God's light into the world, that will start changing the world and manifest the kingdom of God, not bickering as we tend to do. So, all right, that's the genealogy. Uh, again, more to the genealogy than we can ever, we'd be here forever going over it. But hopefully that gives you a little bit different picture of uh, rabbinic thought and the genealogy. So let me stop the share. <laughs> 